the most empowering thing that I have learned in this journey recently is rediscovering or owning my no. So I say no a lot now, happily, because no is a full sentence that I feel really good about exercising. I used to, in my 20s and 30s, feel like I had to justify or excuse why I couldn't do something or any, any no, any, any variation of no. What I love now and the beauty of it, it has liberated me to really understand that I don't owe anyone anything. And let me remove the guilt that I used to feel that I needed to give you an excuse to say no. In the pursuit of my own joy and my journey, if you're not matching me, it's okay. I just don't feel like I need to explain that. And, and that growth has been trying, it's been challenging, it's been beautiful, and I feel like I've learned a lot from it. Welcome back to Since 3000. I'm your host, Danielle Leslie. And I'm so glad that you're joining us today because I have one of my best friends who is my family. So how did Grace go from a professional competitive eater? I'm talking about downing the hot dogs and competing <laughs> with fully baked men to this amazing serial entrepreneur woman who owns her no, who knows how to create a life well lived and is an inspiration for me in different parts of my journey. You're gonna hear all of it. Without further ado, Grace Lee. Thank you for joining me on the sofa. Thank you for having me. Yay. Yeah. I'm so excited to bring you today's episode, but before we do, I need to make sure you've heard about Member Up. So community-driven products are the future, but Facebook groups are a thing of the past. And after 10 plus years in the online education space, I've taken all my learnings and I've built this incredible platform, Member Up. It's a customizable, easy to use, all-in-one platform where you can build a premium course, community, or membership site without the tech headache. Gone are the days of having to duct tape together your content, your community, your payments, all on different platforms. I want you to do me a favor, do yourself a favor and head over right now to memberup.com forward slash Danielle and you can get started for free today. I promise you, I, ooh, I can't wait for you to see this platform. It's beautiful, okay? The design is amazing. Your community is gonna feel at home here and you are gonna take pride in your online business. It is the place to start. Head over to memberup.com forward slash Danielle. Now let's get into the episode. One of my favorite things I learned from you was that life is romantic. And I remember we were here in New York and I think it was fall and we're walking and it was like brisk and you're like, life is romantic. And I've like carried that with me. What does that mean to you? And where did that come from? So, you know, I live by that. Um, I just think that when, I, when we, you and I both moved here in New York, it was a, a very exciting time, right? where we were, but we were both like on the brink of like growing. And I still live by that. I think life is just the most romantic adventure because every day that I wake up and I'm an early morning person, like usually I wake up around 4 a.m. What? Today I woke up at 3 a.m. Oh my goodness. And it's so exciting when you wake up and you have no idea what's gonna happen for the day. So even today when I woke up, I was like, okay, I came in here to do this with you. And I don't know who I'm going to meet, but everyone I'm going to meet, I know it's going to be exciting. I know it's going to be fun. It's going to be a new person that I enjoy. like the interaction. And I think that even without something being planned, when I wake up, I'm really, really excited for what is to come of that day. And I think that the notion of that is extremely romantic. Mm. I don't know if I'm going to meet my husband. I don't know if I'm going to meet my new best friend. I don't know like if the best thing that's ever happened in my career is going to happen, but the idea of that I think is incredibly romantic and the excitement of that gets me fueled every single day. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So I love being with you and we've shared like so many amazing moments. <laughs> yeah. Like our friend group is so dope and we do our birthday celebrations and every moment just, it feels like you're so present. Mm -hmm. Have you always had that 
presence and like connection to the present and like the highest version of this moment? I think so. I think that like coming from the background that I come from and the upbringing that I've had with like immigrant parents and just like my entire journey, like here at 40 years old, I think that um, one of the things I never take for granted is time. So even if you're having a bad day, we all have bad days. We all have really bad days. It just sometimes gets really frustrating. But I think for me, the excitement and the potential of every moment, every time, everything that you do, it can change your life forever. And I think that that potential and excitement is really, really um, large for me. I meet a lot of people on the scale of like big and small and they don't see life that way, which is fine, right? But I think that for me, it's incredibly inspirational and really exciting to just always be like, you never know what's gonna happen. I've had moments in my life that have completely changed my axle mm. off of someone who I never expected. So it could have been my Uber driver, it could have been the guy from the bodega, it could have been my grandmother and there's like a, a singular moment that really changes everything and I'm very acutely aware and very open for receiving that and that is has changed my life. Ooh, I love this like axle changing moment and I'm curious what was a huge defining axle changing moment for you? Hmm, that's so good. I think one of the most beautiful things that I'm proud of is like the curiosity. You know, like I'm always curious about each day, each person, and the curiosity has remained really beautiful in my relationships. And up and down through the courses of like every season, every year of the transitions, it has been the biggest blessing to be really curious and remain curious. Because as we grow, as we elevate, as we become more and more elevated in our success, it's easy to get diluted. So the curiosity has remained pure. So mm. being pure in that curiosity keeps me in almost like this innocent phase of like, who are you? What do you do? How did you get here? How did, and it, it's not about who they are or what they've achieved. It's the curiosity of like, how did you get here in your journey? And I really admire everyone's journey of how they get there. And I think that that's a really beautiful course that I don't take for granted. I remember you were asking, you were really curious about people's like morning routines. Mm -hmm. And I remember you telling me, you're like, yeah, like, I kind of want to just like shadow you for yeah. a couple days and see like how you share your mornings. Yeah. So I'm curious, did we never got a chance to do that, but have you gotten yes. a chance to shadow anyone yet? Okay, it's yes. coming. Yes, yes, have yes. you gotten a chance to shadow anyone on their like morning routine or life? And I'm curious what that was like and what you learned. I have been so incredibly lucky and super, super blessed that I've been able to work with a lot of founders, entrepreneurs, and people that get paid a lot of money to find out where your, your um, holes are. One of the things that I got introduced to a long time ago is that we are all creatures of habit. So one of my favorite things, um, as you know, like I've traveled the world. So it doesn't matter if I'm in a hut in Haiti mm -hmm. or if I'm in this five-star ho hotel in like uh, Tahiti, right? Um, there is a tradition and a routine that we all have and how we honor ourselves. So if you are lucky enough, you get to bathe the same way every day, if you get to, right? Whether you're in your you know, condo or wherever. And we all have this subconscious routine. So I may start the way that I bathe um, my left shoulder, my left arm, da, 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 and we all do. What's really beautiful about that, I never thought about, is that it is a cleansing ritual, if you're lucky enough. And no matter where you are, we tend to subconsciously do, we have the same routine. So there is a part of us that is automatic. We are creatures of habit. And the same way we work in life, the way we work in 
are companies building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I learned from that is that shadowing is really, really valuable because you're like, oh, this is what I do every day. This is how I built my company. This is how I scale. This is how I make. And you're like, okay, well, let me just shadow you. I don't want to get in the way. I just want to follow you. And I can point out some things that you didn't even think about. There's millions of people that go to work before COVID and they transport and they're like, oh, I don't, I don't even remember taking that exit to get to the Google headquarters or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But there is a pattern in that behavior. And I just think that a lot of us, uh, we tend to get dormant when we get comfortable. And there's inspiration when you get rattled in your routine, you can also get inspired. And so for me, I think one of the things that I like to do is I'm constantly moving and people are asking me like, why, why are you always traveling? I'm like, well, it's, it's, I'm not running away from anything, but I never want to become really dormant and comfortable in my routine that I'm not consciously making a decision or I'm not consciously thinking about something that is going to equate to what I want to accomplish for the day. And that is a huge intentional decision that a lot of people don't make. Wow, I love that. I I know that when we met, I'm really curious to like go back. We're gonna time travel back to when we met. So what year was that? 2018? It was yes, it was a lot ago. Um, no, more, more. Really? 2017? No. 16. Oh, I think oh it was my 16. gosh. This is a throwback, throwback. I moved to New York 2018. Yes. When you and I both yes. moved here. 2017. I, I want to say 2016. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. So we met because Steve Cannell was Steve, doing a panel. Yes. And Enaton, and shout out to Enaton and Steve. Um, but Enaton invited me. He's like, hey, you should be on this panel. It was me, you, and Ruben, right? Ruben Harris. Yeah. And Steve was uh, facilitating it. And I remember looking you up on the way. I was in traffic for like two hours. And I was like, all right. But I remember looking you up and I was like, oh my gosh, she looks so dope. Like, she's so cool. And then I get there and you were amazing. Because I know you now. Like, since then, we've like, you're one of my best friends. Yes. Um, and we've shared so many amazing moments. So back to that moment. I know that that was at the towards the beginning of like my journey and like growing my business, I remember where I was and who I was then. And I'm curious, like, where were you and who were you then? So at that time, I think I had just sold my business. Ooh, tell us about that. So we have the hookah in honor of Grace. <laughs> this is a pastime we share in common. We do. Like, it's just special between us. Yes. You know, I did not know what I was doing coming from immigrant parents, family, etc. I was just trying to figure it out. Just like you, when we met, we, what I love about our friendship is that we were both trying to figure it out. And in the early stages, the beauty of the purity in our friendship was neither one of us were like, we, we were, we were just trying to navigate. Mm. And again, going back to the romanticism of that, there's a lot of beauty in it. I, I, I actually now crave, and I don't know how you feel, I crave the beauty and the mystery and the love and the, the early phases because that's oh what I gosh. really thrive on, yes. right? Yes. Because when you get to like a place of like cruise control, it kind of gets, I don't want to say boring, it just gets stale. You're like, mm -hmm. you, you're seeking the challenge. Right. Because yes. when you when we met, we were both hungry mm -hmm. we were just like, oh, my gosh, I really want to figure this out and not to take it for granted. But in the journey of it, there's there's a beautiful path. There's highs and lows. And so going back to Steve and Anaton, who I both love. I've known Steve since he was with Miller. Before he was with Miller, wow. I talked to Anaton this morning. Oh, no he way. was just passing through. I missed him. Oh. But, you know, I will tell you, like the most profound thing that we always have in our communication as a dear friend. I love the way that he loves his wife. I love the way that he loves his kids. And even when we would talk, we talked today, the last thing he said was like, how are you? And as we grow, very few people actually ask me, how am I doing? I see a lot of people. I interact with a lot of people, but very few people ask me, how are you doing? And Anaton has always asked, how are you? Mm. 
And so I responded to him today and I said, listen, this is the most me I have ever felt. It is the most um, intention I have felt living my life, being mindful of myself, of my friends, of other people, and my future, my future self. Mm. So the way that I'm living now is I, I make my decisions, my choices, and I'm very intentional living now to meet my future self. So even with this podcast, I thought that was really interesting. Even when you called me and you were like, Grace, I'm doing this. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Because you're like the future me. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? Mm. And I've had a tremendous life. I, I have no complaints. But in all my journey, I'm really excited to meet my future self. And so the choices I make today is very, very mindful of my future self. And whether it's business, whether it's romantic, whether it's family, whether it's my friends. And that has changed my judgment of how I make my decisions today. And that has been really, really beautiful. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and what I find so impressive about you, and I think we talked about this on our trip when we were in Oaxaca, and it was when you're in a room, a question that never comes up is, what do you do? And you really like our being and connecting with other people's beings. And sometimes I'm like, Grace, but we want to hear what you do because you've accomplished and overcome so much. So I'm going to like nudge you a little bit yeah. because you are an extraordinary entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. I call you the queen of Atlanta. Okay. Queen of ATL is on the sofa with me. As you said, you created a way for yourself. You created a business and it's now, you were able, how many years was it that you were running the business until before you sold it? So I started my first restaurant 10 years ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. I started my bar that I sold now nine years ago. Wow. And it's been five years since I've sold and exited. Oh yeah. my gosh. It's been a fun journey. Everyone that knows me deeply and who worked with me will laugh when they see this because they're like, oh, you had, n I had no idea what I was doing. Oh, wow. So you didn't, when you started the business, did you start it with the intention to sell it? What was no, your, no, no, what no, was no, your no. vision or intention when you started no, it? No, I just, I just, I just thought it would be cool to like open a restaurant or open a bar. Like wow. I had no idea. Back then it, this wasn't a thing. Back then it was not a cool thing. It wasn't even a thing to like sell your business to exit, wow. to sell, like none of that was normal conversation. Mm. So it's really fun to look back at that time because it was really, really fun for the purity of what it was. It was really fun. What were some of the challenges you faced in those early days when you were running the business? Oh, do you want to go there? <laughs> yes. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> so at that time, you know, now like, I mean, even when I opened my first restaurant, like Instagram wasn't alive, right? Mm. It was, uh, what is the, I don't know. Like Tumblr. Tumblr. Ooh, Tumblr that's a throwback. Was new, mm -hmm. And then it was like Twitter. Mm -hmm. Instagram yep. wasn't alive mm. when I started my business. And um, I have tremendous like gratitude for like that era. But to see it now is really, really different. It's really different. And it's really different to see it, you know, hindsight is 2020. So to see it as a woman, to see it as a woman of color, to see it as a young entrepreneur is all different. I give everyone like my biggest blessing that want to achieve these things, but it, it was a really different world. Wow. It was really, really hard. I, I, I won't placate to be like, oh, it was, no, it was really hard. Yeah, yeah, I remember you sharing how I think you would like work all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember you saying, you know, as the owner of the business, you were still there in the day to day and you were like serving and cleaning and um, marketing, promoting, welcoming the guests, like doing all those things. It's amazing to hear that you caught the attention of a buyer who saw value in what you had created. Um, and I know that your specialty has become helping other businesses to launch 
and you know market themselves so i'm curious i'm like okay in the days pre ig like pre all these tools we have what was your like superpower what was your secret sauce what do you think was able to like grow this business and make it special so i now as an investor since i've sold and exited and i've diversified i really my philosophy is all business is people business so whether you sell shoes or whether you sell liquor mm. all business is people business if you don't understand that you've already failed um i think that relationships are incredibly incredibly important to your success of we have so many difficult things that are working against us so if you want to get there the number one thing is like integrity um relationships mm hard work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't matter how much money you have or who's backing you or whatever. It, it is, it comes down to integrity and relationships. Everything I've ever done in my life, that is the only foundation that I could give credit to. Nothing else really matters. But the shame is that like now in our culture, as things have change and evolved social media or um things becoming very transactional we have lost a lot of that quality mm -hmm. and what's terrible and i see it every day now um the same people and without like naming anyone the biggest relationships i have now come from like the simplicity of like integrity like mm -hmm. hey I don't care how busy you are. I don't care how hungover you are. I don't care how, whatever. If, if we were supposed to do something and if I reach out to you and if you drop that ball, this deal could be done and that could be a $100,000 deal versus, hey, I just happened to be in town. I saw you're doing this. And it's not about like, oh, let me hook you up. It's just honoring your word. And I think that in our time, this is really unique. That has been really diluted. So a lot of people say they're going to do something and a lot of people do not follow through. And I really pay attention, not just me, but the people that are my peers on this higher level. We're not keeping tabs, but you, you remember. You remember somebody that said, hey, pull up to this. And then now you've made it really difficult for me to show up here mm -hmm. and you invited me so let's keep this really simple let's keep it classy you know like if, if you ask me to do something let's make this seamless because none of this is rocket science it's fairly easy but let's keep it classy and let's keep it seamless and let's all grow together i'm here to help you you're here to help me and that's really it like it's not it's not that hard i love that if you are a creative entrepreneur and your business is unique, why are you working with a generic accountant? One of the best decisions I made was who I would partner with on my taxes and my accounting. So if you're a creative entrepreneur, you are growing your business, you're scaling your business, I want to introduce you to Revel. Revel is a firm that can help you whether you're looking to prepare your taxes or you're looking for that year round support. They will tell you what's happening in your business and why. So if you're tired of being ignored, talked down to, or feeling like you are chasing around your accountant and needing to drive the relationship you're yourself, it's time for a change. Head over to revelcpa.com, R-E-V-E-L-C-P-A.com. Head on over, fill out their interest form, and make sure you look into working with them. Again, that is revelcpa.com, R-E-V-E-L-C-P-A.com. We all deserve the right firm to partner with. It's been proven that procrastination can be one of our biggest enemies to success. Now, contrary to belief, procrastination is not based on a lack of time management or organizational skills. Procrastination is directly linked to our emotions. Now, the reason I know this is because of Patty Johnston. Patty Johnston is incredible. She's a course from scratch member, but even more importantly, she's built multiple multi-million dollar businesses once she learned how to overcome procrastination. So she's created a program where she shares her system on how to overcome procrastination, and it's based on emotional intelligence, neuroscience, and accountability. She's going to show you step-by-step step how to overcome negative feelings so you can start taking action and start seeing a difference from day one. So text this number right now to schedule an appointment with Patty and her team to see if this is right for you and what steps for you to take to overcome your procrastination. 
813-789-1097. And again, the number to text right now is 813-789-1097. Let's all overcome procrastination together. Now let's get back to the episode. I feel that from you. So I've seen it. There are like two stories I want to share. And I'll start with when I was freezing my eggs because I mean, you offered, so I was, um, I froze my eggs last yes, year. Yes. Actually, it's about a year I ago. Just, I just paid my renewal. Oh, no way. So you're going to do like a second round? Is that what you no, mean No, no, no. I just paid my renewal oh, because for my they storage. storage. That's right. Yes. yes. You have to pay to. So I think mine is like $400 a, a year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I was getting ready to freeze my eggs and then. Um, you're like, oh, you're like, Danny, I can come and I can come and support you. I was like, but you're like, no, no, I can like come to your house and I can be there with you. And I was like, really? And you're like, yeah. And I remember when I was figuring out and, and, you know, navigating the experience and preparing for it because, you know, you've got to kind of know 30 days in advance. Okay. For the next cycle, we're going to be going in, we're going to be going to our appointments. And I knew that I wanted to be in the best, like emotional, spiritual, physical state because I didn't know what was in store, you know? And I heard stories about, okay, you're going to be like extra hormonal. They're like, however you are in your cycle, it's going to be like 10 X because Mm -hmm. you'll be taking more estrogen and who knows? And so I'm like, okay. So I'm like hearing that. And I remember speaking with you and I heard an account that was like, well, you know, I heard of a person who froze their eggs and this was their experience. And I was like, "Uh Oh, okay. And I spoke with you and I was like, Hey, like what, what can I expect? And you're like, you know, I said it was going to be amazing and it was amazing. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna try that on. So you really impacted my egg freezing experience. Oh. Like you really made a huge difference. And I think like it showed me the importance of, you know, who you surround yourself by. And I love that you're like, like, we're going to call it like we want it to go and it's going to go that way. And I remember going into the experience, having that spirit. And I thought of you because I was like, so, so Grace, like, did you stay in one place for like two weeks straight and maybe like, you know, not drink and like be super conservative. You're like, I just live my life. Like I, I just, out. I was doing my thing. And I was like, okay. So while I was freezing my eggs, I think it was, you know, like a couple days in and you know, you have your like appointments every other day. And at that point I had my uh, members of my CEO circle, they were going to see Usher in concert in Vegas. And I was like, okay, that sounds dope. And so I said, so, I mean, and you know, the whole, the whole process is like you, and if you haven't gone through this experience, it's like you get your set of shots and you like, you know, give yourself the shot in the abdomen, like once a day and sometimes twice a day, depending it's on where intense. you are in the cycle. Yeah. And, and I remember looking up videos online and for some women, they were like, oh, and then I was like, oh, okay. Okay. And then, you know, so I was like, okay, got it. And then the videos from the center were like, Okay, you're just gonna and I was like, okay. So I I remember seeing like the crossroads and I was like, I can decide which story I want to believe on how it's gonna go, and then I'll do my best to embody that. And so when I started it, I was like, oh, okay, I got it. This is great. So when I got the invitation for Usher, I was like, you know what? We gonna do this. I remember when you went. <laughs> I remember that. I was you were like, my yeah. inspiration. Cause I was like, yeah, girl. you were like, I was going out, I was having a ball. And so I remember I packed my suitcase. And I had an 8 a.m. appointment. So I went to, and I uh, went with Kind Body. So I went to Kind Body right here in New York. I went to my 8 a.m. appointment. They checked everything out. I was like, cool, cool, cool. And then she's like, okay, so like, um, so you're taking it easy. And I was like, well, no, I, I'm going straight to the airport. I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to see Usher. And then I'll be back like tomorrow. So I'll be back in time for my appointment on Friday. And she was like, oh, okay, that's an interesting choice, yeah. but okay. And I was like, yeah. And I remember going and being in Vegas, but I actually like felt pride. I was like, all right, we're about to see Usher. And I was like, let's go, let's get these eggs. And then, you know, we went to the concert and we did the whole backstage thing and met him and it was super fun. But I remember you being the inspiration from that. And like, when you talk about being your word, the fact that I knew that when you said, I can be there for you. Like I can be there with you if you'd like. And I believed you. And I knew you weren't just, that wasn't just like talk. Like you were really gonna be there. injections in. Hold hold on. Okay. There we go. Yes. Yes. No, it was great. I I will say, I think the greatest, whew, that's like such a heavy topic. So, you know, I have had my health journey and I think that 
maybe even now more than ever, even when you were going through it, when I was going through it, and just the the choice that women are offered in our everything and politics we don't need to go into, but it's it's an incredibly sensitive topic. Mm. And I went through my journey because of health, right? And I was like, okay, well, I want to exercise my right and I want to feel empowered to do what I want options to have. I don't know if I want to have babies, but perhaps if I do, the best thing I can do in my 40s is to have them sitting somewhere where I can utilize this option. And even then, it wasn't, it wasn't as um, commonly talked about. It wasn't as exercise. It wasn't as sexy, whatever. But I just felt like, okay, um, this is something I just want to have for a rainy day. And then I did it, and then I talked to you, and I, I've actually, like, I, I never publicized it. I never posted anything about my journey, but I had had multiple friends who were like, oh, you're doing this. How was your experience? I was like, my experience is great. And then they, like you, they all froze their eggs. And I was like, oh, wow. Mm. And, and even still, I haven't talked about it. But I think the revolution of science has empowered women to say, you know, I don't, I didn't know my life was going to be like this. I didn't know I was going to build a company. I didn't know I was going to start this. But whether or not I want kids, I just want to have the option. So for me, in my journey, I, I still don't know. I'm 40 years old and I still don't know whether or not definitive, like, I have no idea. I would just hate for the day to come where I do want kids and I no longer have options. Science, religion, God, whatever you believe in is a very interesting thing and it becomes very personal when it becomes personal with your health. And so for me, I didn't know what that was, but before the pressure of trying to decide what I wanna do, I just wanted options. So I did what I did for my own self and then a lot of my girlfriends were like, oh, how was your experience? And I was like, listen, I, was, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't partying, but I was still enjoying myself. I was doing my life. I did whatever. I read that as partying. I was, you probably didn't say that, but I was like, okay, Grace was getting it in. Okay. <laughs> I, I was. I was still traveling. I was still going to birthday parties. I was still, I mean, I wasn't out till 3 a.m., but I might have been out till 11. And I was still enjoying my whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel the pressure like... This is now or never. Mm -hmm. And that was a great blessing from my doctor. And then after I did it, um, it was approaching my birthday and I never thought about it in this context. But before that, I never, I never thought about kids. I, I just thought I was so perfectly healthy. And one day, whenever I feel like having babies, I'm gonna have babies. Mm -hmm. When that became very real and I had to make choices and evaluate what my options were, and this is something we don't talk about, right? It's very taboo in our communities. I was like, okay, well, if I do this now, whether or not I choose to do this, it will be there. And that really empowered me. So I'm single, I haven't exercised my, like, I paid my renewal, my eggs and storage and whatever. But my thing was, God forbid that I am ready to have kids and now I don't have options. So it was, it was the empowerment and being able to exercise as a woman of having the option to this privilege, mm. right? Because most women can't afford this. Let me exercise this option. And if I never use it, if I never have babies, I can donate it to science. I can donate it to another woman who's been praying about this mm. and I can skip along my merry way, but I never want to be deprived of my options. And I think especially now in politics and our society and our culture in the world and women, it is incredibly important to protect your options. Whether or not I use it, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I may or may not even want to vote, you know, but let me protect that mm. because that is something that our parents, our, our history, our ancestry, like, fought for. I, I may never even want babies. But let me give my eggs to some woman who's been praying for this. Mm. Let me donate my eggs to some science that has been, you know, trying to figure this out. And... I still don't know that answer, but at least now I feel very empowered. So I never, I, I never thought about babies until after I did it. 
after I did it, everybody was like, how do you feel? I was like, I feel so free. I feel so liberated. Wow. I feel like I am turning 40. I'm still single. But hey, I got these eggs in a freezer for a rainy day. It yeah, yeah like <laughs> may happen, may not happen, but mm -hmm. at least they're there. And that mm -hmm. was really powerful, especially I think in the state that we are in politics, in the world and everything that we believe in now that we don't talk about. Absolutely. I remember having a conversation with Crystal um, with my best friend and she was like, you know, I was thinking like, this is such a blessing that you get to do this. Yeah. Like every woman doesn't have this opportunity. Oh, yeah. Like us as women in this age, in this time, the fact that we have the ability to build a business, yeah. um, you know, not necessarily have the like pressure of, or the, you know, the stipulation, like, okay, we've got to conceive by this time. Um, and I was like, you're right. And I remember like reflecting on that, that day I remember where I was in the car and I was on my way back home. And um, so you're absolutely right. So you mentioned your, if you're open to speaking about it, about your health yeah, journey, yeah. which I think it helped yeah, like so many it. people. Yeah. Because I feel like we, so we're both very independent. And I call it like, um, what do I call it? Like self-sufficient. And I'm like, cause I'm like, I'm very like self-sufficient. I'm like self-contained, you know, I'm like, I don't, I don't reach out every now and then I'm getting better. And I would say that like last year was a huge transition for me to, yeah. uh, making my friends family and making that transition from friends to family. Um, and so you are my family, like you're a part of that family unit, but we always laugh because we're like, we don't need to talk every day, every week, every month, every quarter sometimes. And I remember last year, we didn't talk quite often at all. And then I didn't learn until later. I was like, oh, like Grace went through a health journey and I learned about it afterwards. And I was like, wow. And so I think it would be so helpful um, just to share if you're open to it, just like yeah. what that journey was like. Which part? I guess what, yeah, what happened? You, I mean, cause. You mm, so I, I would say that like for me, I have, I've never even had a fever. So I've been, Whoa. by all conditions, medically, you would think like I've been a perfect, healthy life. I've yes. never even had a fever. I've never even had the flu shot. Whoa. So I've been super healthy. And then at the time when I sold my business, um, all of a sudden, just randomly, I, they, I went for my annual checkup. They found this tumor. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. Let's just monitor, watch it. And it's in six months, my tumor tripled in size. Wow. All good. It happens. And where was the tumor? Uh, my uterus. Oh. So my yeah, it, ha it tripled in size in six months, which is pretty quick. And again, I had no fever. I had never had any medical issues. And then uh, when that happened, they were like, okay, well, the doctor's like, we need to remove this. And I was like, all right, well, okay, what does that mean? So I had a full C-section. Um, no baby. I thought it was humorous, but my mom and dad did not appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I got a full C-section, no baby yes. now. <laughs> At the number one baby hospital. Wow. Yeah, North Carolina Hospital. They're like, oh, this is the number one baby hospital in the country, and you had no baby. Anyway, uh, they didn't think it was, I thought it was funny. Um, oh and so we did that, and it was all good. Mm -hmm. Everything got cleared. And, you know, it's usually a year when the doctors say, okay, you're in the clear now. Like, you know, you're dormant, you've been benign, like no, no cancer scares, whatever. Almost five years to the day, almost like a week off, Whoa. I got diagnosed with uterine cancer. Wow. Yeah. During COVID. Mm. I didn't think I was going to get emotional. Mm. So that yeah. happened you know, almost five years to the day. It was during the pandemic, early stages of pandemic. And again, I still hadn't had a fever. Like we're dealing with this global, like the world has never seen this. We don't know how to handle it, but this time it was cancerous. So it was just like, okay, well now what are you gonna do? And it was just, but it actually it was the best thing that ever happened in my life. The best thing that ever happened. Yeah. So during that time, the whole world was terrified. Like no one knew how bad, how severe, like everything just shut down. And Dave Chappelle started doing his summer camp in the middle of like a cornfield in Ohio. I was just extremely blessed to be invited to that. And I spent 
the entire 2020 in a cornfield with Dave Chappelle and his family. Wow. Yeah. He was actually the very first person. So I went not knowing, you know, like, whatever. This They found something. I go. And uh, the doctors called me. And I, so Yellow Springs is two blocks. Literally two blocks. Wow. There's nothing in Yellow Springs. The population is 3,500. Whoa. And so I was there. And the doctors called me and they're like, hey, we have your results. And I was like, okay. And they're like, "Um, sorry to tell you that what we found is cancerous. And, you know, you, you, this is June, July, 2020, like the beginning of COVID, beginning of all this stuff. The world is very scared. And I'm in the middle of this small town and I'm there with like D- Dave Chappelle and friends, you know, like Erica Baidu, Common, like who, every, everybody, and everyone's terrified. Mm. And I was just like, okay. And I was walking down the street, and they're like, so we think we need to do this, you know, doctor language. And I was like, okay. Um, they're like, are you okay? And I was like, actually, I don't think that there is a better place in the world at this time that I could have received this information. Because Dave had created this bubble, this insulated bubble, because he was paying for everyone out of pocket to get COVID tested. Everybody was coming from New York, LA, whatever, all these incredible, talented people. But we were all scared because we didn't know what COVID was going to be. So that happened. And I got the I got off the phone and I didn't tell anybody. No one knew. And I was like, actually, I think this is the best place I could have ever received this kind of information. So I spent the rest of the weekend. It was the most incredible weekend. Erica Baidu, she's like, I see your spirit. I see your love. It was just amazing. Mm. And what else happened that weekend? Oh, my God. It was Dave brought in all of his friends and family from all over the world out of his pocket to create this magical experience in the cornfields of Yellow Springs, Ohio. It was just magical. It was really magical. And I didn't tell anyone what I had discovered on that phone call. And then at that time, during the pandemic of Atlanta, you know, Black Lives Matter was a real thing. There was riots. There was racial, there was outrage. There was a lot of things happening at that time. It was a very sensitive time. Mm -hmm. Technically, my residence was still in New York. You know, this is like, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And I had a rental car. So I'm like, I gotta, I gotta go. Like, Mm -hmm. I have to go back. The doctors told me I need to like go back home. And uh, Atlanta had declared a national state of emergency where they had, um, I don't know what you call it, but like the tanker trucks, like there was riots on, on another level because of black lives matter and everything else that was happening at the time. And Dave was like, Grace, where are you going? Like, just, just stay. We're doing movie night at the house. Like, just stay. We're going to hang out. Like we're going to just, why would you go back to Atlanta? It's like, it's in a state of emergency. Just stay like, you know, the president has declared, and I was like, I, but I had so much anxiety. I was like, I need to go. Like, I just, I have a rental car. I, I just need to get back and I need to go to the doctor. And he was like, okay. Had you told anyone even in your life at this point? He was the first person I told. Wow. I mean, when I say I was like sobbing, like, mm. a, like a baby, I, I was just crying. And not because I was telling him I just found out I have cancer. I was crying because I was like, thank you for providing this beautiful, insulated bubble of love Mm. with these amazing people because we don't know if the world is going to end tomorrow. But you have created this beautiful experience for all of us to trust and share. And egos are left out. And we're all just... We don't, we don't know what's going to happen, but thank you so much for allowing me into your home, into your bubble, into your friends, and da, da, da. He was the very first person I shared my diagnosis with. Yeah. 
Then I got in the rental car. I drove home that day, and the rest is history. So I'm good now, but it was just a it was an incredibly teachable moment of number one, our health, uh, what's important, our relationships, what are we doing, um, just just life like we 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 get so caught up in things that are not so important and then when the world when you think the world is ending Mm -hmm. you just have no idea how to combat that and and everything gets really calibrated very quickly these things and i i don't even like social media and the stress and your none of that is really important Mm -hmm. when you realize okay, so <laughs> things get really real. <laughs> what am I going to stress about? Mm. And I talked about you that um, in San Diego when we mm. went, I was like, listen, stress is a choice. I believe Oof. stress is a choice. So if you're like, I'm so tired. I didn't sleep. I'm so tired from work. I'm so tired from my friends. I'm so tired from my family. All of that is a choice. And mm. I just believe stress is a choice that we don't have to partake in. And mm. that has really changed my entire life. <laughs> Great! I didn't know I was going to be like tissue. Like, oh my gosh! Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, well, I didn't know we were going to go there. That's always like, Me neither. We just flowing. We are flowing. I was like, oh, we're on the street now. Okay. We are flowing. Hi. I know. Wow. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me mm. and then so to because my question of curiosity is so i guess you returned to atlanta and then did you surgically remove it and then it was I done did. Ah. i did but let me tell you so the first time it was it was a five-year difference so the very first time that i had the tumor i had to have a full c-section you know it's before covid so my family, friends, everyone came. Da, 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 da. It was funny. It was cute. Like, whatever. I had a whole... You probably had hookah in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was all good. <laughs> now, when I did that after 2020, mm. um, it was a combination of this time, okay, it's, it's not benign. It is cancerous. And also, because of COVID, the hospital was extremely sterile. So the first time I had all my friends, family, teddy bears, flowers, everyone came. Second time, because it was 2020, no one could even drop me off. Like, you had to get COVID tested before you pulled into the hospital. So it was very sterile. That contrast of experience felt very cold. And I will say, I don't think I've ever felt lonely in my life. I'm blessed to say that, because I think I have a lot of family and friends. That experience felt so incredibly cold and sterile because no one could come with me. Mm. It was COVID. So it's like, I can't even drop you off. Like you have to, you have to pull in, get COVID tested. Then you have your surgery. I mean, my friends were having babies and their spouse couldn't even be in the room to like deliver Mm. their child. This was at that time. So it was, it was a very unique experience. I know that we have come over, I think, the hump of COVID, but there was a huge, incredible window of time where people experienced COVID on a different level. People people lost family members in COVID that they couldn't say goodbye to. People had babies during COVID that they couldn't be in the room with. Like that window was really unique. Mm. And I think as a human community, I don't care who you are, where you lived in the world and how much money or how little money you had. There was it was a really solidifying bond because I don't I don't know of any other time that people experience that. Absolutely. So that was really interesting. I think about going into the future, the next generation, our kids, our friends, kids, the grandparents like COVID will be a time we talk about that like is unique to <laughs> our generation yeah. in where we were and what we were experiencing that you think about the folks who lived through like the Great Depression and they're like, this is what it was like. Yeah. We were in the lines like for food, like trying to do our best. And some of those those experiences you shared, um, I think are really Well, unique when we did your experience. birthday, we yeah. did your birthday in a limo. Yes. I talk about that all the time. I'm like, listen, 
Danny was in New York and she was selling her, uh, her birthday top of COVID. We still wanted to celebrate, but how do you celebrate? New York is shut down. So when you got the limo and we were riding around, <laughs> riding around New York yes, in a limo, we were. only to experience how to feel somewhat normal. Because mm. at that point, it was like, what is normal? Mm-hmm. And we're riding around this limo, like drinking. We didn't go anywhere. We came straight back we here. We went everywhere. Yeah. And nowhere. But we also came back here. <laughs> exactly. We, we didn't get out of the limo. Right. But that was a really, one, it was a really creative way to celebrate. But also, I think at that time for your birthday in February, we were, we were all so thirsty, like seeking mm-hmm. human contact. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there was 10 of us. And we all came here to celebrate you and we got in a limo and we drove around and we came back here and it was just like, oh my gosh, because at that point it was still like coming off of the pandemic where like no one knew what to do. Like, can I hug you? Can I touch you? Can I, are you wearing That's a mask? True. Like it was, it was still new Yeah. and we didn't know what to do. We didn't know how severe that was going to be. Mm-hmm. So that was really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That was such a fun time. It was. And I think. I remember like you really invite others on journeys with you. And I remember you were coming to New York and it was around Christmas time and there was like a white elephant gift exchange. Uh, and it's Quest funny Love. because <laughs> yes. Uh it was Quest Love's like gift exchange. There's a sign, yes. tell the truth sign. And it was so funny because I remember when you told me you're like, "All right, Quest Love is putting on the white elephant gift exchange it's really special you're gonna pick something and it's gonna be of significance to you yeah and when we get there we're gonna share you know what it's about and so i took that seriously i was like i know grace okay (laughs) we need to be we need to okay integrity hello it needs to okay so i looked i was like exactly exactly i was like okay what we about to bring and i was like okay i'm looking i'm thinking i'm like and i was like oh my god the tell the truth sign which somehow we got to bring it we got to show it somehow But it's a neon green, Ritz. tell the truth sign. And the lettering matches my tattoo. It's like yes. the same kind of like cursive. Yes. So I'm like, oh my gosh, that's it. And I'm like, I'm gonna bring this tell the truth sign, which is not, it's not a small sign. So I like, remember, I'm like, do I have a bag big yeah. enough? But I had my whole story. I'm like, I'm gonna talk about, you know, the, the ending of one relationship and the journey of who am I and why telling the truth is so important, not only to others, but to yourself. And I have a whole little speech prepared. I'm like, oh, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be like 10 people. Everybody's gonna love it. And then like we go to the um, Museum of Ice Cream. Yes. It was so fun. And I was like, okay, Museum of Ice Cream. I've never been here before. And again, the elevator, and I see people I recognize from TV growing up. And I was like, oh my God, hey Hillary, how are you? I was gonna say Hillary okay, from Fresh, Fresh Prince. Prince. Yes. And I was like, she's super dope. How are you? And then we go down to the basement, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we have all the, the swings and everything. And then I'm like, oh, oh, there's more than 10 people. <laughs> Oh, is it, it was like, like 40 people. I know, right? I was like, oh, this, this is a big group. Maybe, is there another room? Oh, oh, this is, okay, we're here. Okay. <laughs> Hello. So I remember like going through the exercise and then the, I had my little speech prepared and I was like, oh, and then as it went around, I was like, oh, I'm not going to get to tell my speech. And I was like, this is not, I prepared it for nothing. I rehearsed it. I was ready to impress the people. And, but it was so funny because I like imagined this whole thing in my mind and and it was so fun though like it was so fun there were so so many different gifts i think the tell the truth sign got exchanged maybe like two or three times because at the very last like stage games yeah it was very like, relevant they were like the top, it was like five gifts that people it was had aggressive. On, and they it were was like very aggressive they were like let me get the the shroom chocolate that's mine yeah like there were like five gifts and i remember i think it got exchanged like twice and the original guy that got it i went over to him and i was like because he was like oh man and i'm like hey hey i can show you how to get your own mate <laughs> and i'm like give me your number i'll text you the information and i got it i was like mommy can you send me the information on how you got this made yes. and i like sent it to him um but it was cool because i did get to connect on that one-to-one level yeah. and like here like okay why did you why why did this speak to you um i can help you get one on your own um but it was so funny because i'm like okay mommy we gotta she's like wait 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 you took the tell the truth i was like 
by the way, how much did that cost? She's like, $400. I remember that. And I was like, You were like, oh, damn, shit. I didn't know. I was like, usually a white elephant is like $10, maybe $50, but $400. But I was like, that's not me. Okay, I was trying to do too much. T- DTM, do too much. All right. But it was very popular. <laughs> Yes, we got a new one to grace the space. And since then, we've done tell the truth circles here. And I, I think that. that started at my birthday. Oh, yes. um, and so we actually do it here. I love that. We have a tell the truth moment. Are we having that moment? We are having okay, it right okay, now. Okay, okay, let's go. What is a truth that is on your heart mm-hmm. that maybe you haven't shared with anyone Maybe not even yourself yet. So I will say, like, remember in San Diego when I told you, I was like, I just learned my no. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I just learned my no at 40, and I didn't know that I had ever lost my no, thanks to Taria. I had never known that I had lost my no. And I think that the most empowering thing that I have learned in this journey recently is... um, rediscovering or owning my no. So I say no a lot now, happily, because no is a full sentence that I feel really good about exercising. I used to, in my 20s and 30s, feel like I had to justify or excuse why I couldn't do something or any any no, any, any variation of no. What I love now and the beauty of it, it has give me, given me freedom And now I say no happily because it has liberated me to really understand that I don't owe anyone anything. And that includes family, that includes friends, that includes past lovers, it includes everyone. I don't owe you something. And let me remove the guilt that I used to feel that I needed to give you an excuse to say no. And in my growth, I'm sure as your growth, since we've known each other, um, in me growing and climbing, people feel more and more entitled, including friends, that I owe them an explanation. So what has been really beautiful is me saying no without, that's it, no period. It has given me a lot of freedom to just enjoy that space Also, it's given me a reflection of my real relationships. So a lot of people that I've known for 20 years, all of a sudden now I just say no and I see a different side of you pivoting as a reaction of my no, but uh, there's no hard feelings. It's just, it's just the, it's just where we are. And in the pursuit of my own joy and my journey, If you're not matching me it's okay i just don't feel like i need to explain that and and that growth has been trying it's been challenging it's been beautiful and i i feel like i've learned a lot from it and we talked about that and oh my gosh yes yeah i remember in San Diego being in the kitchen across from you and you were on that side of the island. I was on this side and you were sharing it with the group, but I was like, she's speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And I know that I had definitely most of my life where I did feel the fear of disappointing someone, hurting their feelings. And so I would appease, go along with. And what I didn't realize is I was storing that somewhere. Yeah. And it wouldn't necessarily show up in the like traditional recognizable, you know, resentment, things like that. But it was still creating a filter, a wall and not allowing me to like fully express myself as my highest self. And so it's like that is something I've started practicing. And I loved the language you put on it because I didn't have a name for it. I didn't have a way of thinking about it. For me, it was like, oh, I want to like tell my truth. And that's how I thought about it. But you saying it's practicing my no, like when I'm feeling it, it's no, that totally simplified it for me. And you shared how as kids, because you're like, I'm finding my no. And then I think you shared this example of, you know, when you're a kid, like you have no's. You got a lot of no's. You're like, no, I don't want broccoli. Like, do you want this? (laughs) No, I don't want it. No. And 
kids are not like like we're not like but why no you don't ask it like but why don't you want the broccoli you're like okay you know like got it and so i loved that it's kind of like coming back to our no because we started with a no because we're like no I, for whatever it's reason i feel some, it in my body nope. for some reason i think we are conditioned number one as women mm. and then additionally all the other layers of whatever over time we are conditioned to apologize for our no and so what Taria really brought to the forefront, I, I mean, I was like boo-hoo crying mm. on that trip. And she's like, who took away your no? I was like, I, I, I don't know. Ooh. And she's like, well, who, when did you lose your no? And I said to her, I was like, I don't ever remember having a no. And then she was like, oh, you had a no. She's like, maybe you lost it when you were two or three or one or whatever. But she's like... I was like, I don't remember ever having a no. And that trip was really good for me because I realized one, I lost my no when I was too young to remember. But two, also like, that is a really powerful thing that women should know. And I don't even recall when I lost it because my duty in my life of 40 years was like, I have to be the daughter, I have to be the sister, I have to be this, I have to be that. And I don't remember ever exercising my no. And that is really critical in how we grow as people because it's, it's, it's a powerful element that when you take away, aside from women, aside from women of color, aside from all these things that we deal with in social injustice, when you take away someone's no, you are ripping away they're 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 right and we're dealing with that now but it was something i never even thought about ever mm. um i think that's just really valuable it's really important that we know where we stand and even as small children we know when when it is okay to say no and from there as a small child to growing it but in, in society and women and our culture and then corporate culture and everything else, everything that we do, I think it's really powerful, but we get stripped of that um, ability and, and that is something I feel really passionate about, but I never even thought about it. Wow. Yeah. It's huge. Thank you. Listen. Sometimes life be life and we do not know what's coming down that road next. Well, that's what happened to me in 2016 when I was unexpectedly laid off from my job and I was six figures in student loan debt. I had no savings and I didn't know what was going to happen next. Now, luckily, I had this little voice inside of me at that time that I couldn't ignore and it was telling me to take the leap. It was saying, use this as your opportunity to build your business. Use this as your opportunity to create your dream life. And so I believe that life happens for us, not to us. And that nudge in my spirit, I should listen to it. Luckily I did. Fast forward to today, I have a business that's made over $20 million and I've helped over 10,000 people create their online businesses and their dream lives. So do you wanna learn how to turn your story into an online product and launch in 30 days? Head on over to coursefromscratch.com forward slash since 3000. I want you to join us on this journey so you can listen to that little voice inside of you too. So go now, do yourself a favor, coursefromscratch.com forward slash since 3000.